Hi, this is Mr Harding and I'm going to be talking you through how to prepare for the Year 9 assessment. The Year 9 assessment is split into two separate subjects, which is English Literature and English Language, for which students will have 55 minutes for each exam. Lord of the Flies is what we'll be focusing on for English Literature, and that will be an extract-based assessment, which is designed to reflect the style of assessment that will be completed in Year 11 as part of the GCSEs, but is, of course, on a different text. Importantly, for English Literature, we are going to allow students to plan their assessment. So this PowerPoint will also or mainly be talking um, Year 9 students and parents through how to uh, revise and create that plan. Um, and English Language um, is going to be Imaginative Writing, uh, which is also designed to mimic the um, kind of assessment that will be completed um, in Year 11 as part of the GCSEs. For that, students will not be able to take in a plan. They'll have to uh, plan um, in the um, set 55-minute um, time limit. The following slides are designed to talk you through how to approach the uh, extract based questions and thinking about the differences between them. Part A is extract based, so students will be given an A4 page from Lord of the Flies and they will need to comment on that um, only for the duration of Part A. The focus of Part A is on close textual analysis, which includes analysis of language and structure but I'll provide more detail on that moving forward. Part B, however, requires you to not comment on the extract at all, but rather look at multiple moments from other parts of the novel. For this, it's important to have a good knowledge of the entire text so that you can draw in the best examples. But for this question, there is no need for close textual analysis. It involves looking at the big picture or zooming out noting that the questions on this slide are the actual questions that the year nine will be assessed on as part of the literature assessment however moving forward i'll be looking at different or slightly reworked questions in order to provide examples that do not at the same time uh, give the answers away um, so the following questions that i'm going to use um, are not uh, the ones that um, are actually um, being used in the assessment for part A, it's recommended that you aim to write uh, between two and three paragraphs, with each paragraph addressing a different or a slightly different response to the question. To talk you through this paragraph style, I'll be looking at the example question, explore how Golding presents the theme of fear in the extract. It's important that students approach these paragraphs in a methodical way, first thinking about a point that specifically answers the question. In this case, it's the fact that the theme of fear is explored through the tension of Ralph being hunted. So we're looking at a specific way that uh, the theme of the fear is explored. And uh, you'll see that in red, I've highlighted quotations. It's recommended that when planning, students try to find two appropriate quotations in order to make sure their paragraphs are well developed and, um, and provide adequate detail. It's worth always thinking about what the best quotations are, not just the best quote, um, the first quotation that comes to mind, but the best quotations that can be used um, for analysing from many different angles. A lot of marks in this part of the assessment go towards language analysis, and you'll see that I've underlined um, examples of, of techniques uh, uh, being used. For example, visual imagery, rhetorical question, and a structural bit of analysis, in this case looking at the use of paragraphs, and more specifically smaller paragraphs. 
If people have a quick read through uh, the paragraph, you'll also see that the explanations are specific. It's not just saying something like visual imagery creates an image in the reader's head, which you theoretically could say for any quotation. In this case, it's saying that visual imagery implies that Ralph is terrified by the genuine threat that he'd be killed with his emotions manifesting physically. And I think you'll find that the top marks will go to the people that are really able to um, provide specific um, analysis um, that, is, um, that provides a unique perspective. As mentioned in the previous slide, the analysis of language and structural techniques is essential in part A. In order to be helpful, I've provided a list of techniques that students could identify and in some cases uh, where I think it's necessary provided definitions. This isn't a list of all the techniques that could be identified, but I think it should go some way to provide some help. This is an example part B question that is different from the one that will be completed in the actual exam. It says that in this extract, the conflict between Ralph and the hunters reaches its climax. Explore how conflict is presented elsewhere in the novel. To begin planning for this response, students first need to think about two or three appropriate extracts to look at within the text that they can use uh, to focus on in each of their two or three paragraphs. The important thing is to think, first of all, OK, well, what are good examples of um, conflict occurring in the novel? But then most importantly, in each example, why is that conflict significant? So, for example, there may be a conflict between Ralph and Jack. And then you need to think when you're formulating your point, well, what is the actual function of this conflict? What does it tell us about one of the major themes in the text? Or how does it contribute to our understanding of those characters and their relationships? This is an example paragraph showing how to approach a part B response. Uh, just like I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, the first thing to note is the quality of the point. Rather than just identifying an example of conflict, it actually looks at the reason why that conflict is significant. In this case, it looks at the conflicting themes of savagery and reason, which both Jack and Ralph uh, respectively um, represent. Just like the part A paragraphs, you're looking at trying to include two quotations. But in this case, rather than analysing and looking at language or structural analysis, I think you're doing what I would um, describe as explaining or evaluating. These explanations I view as an opportunity to just think deeply about the meaning of the quotations and try to um, uh, show a bit of inference, I would say. So, for example, the first quotation, when it's explained, uh, I look at how um, uh, it explores how the two characters are really importantly linked and that uh, defines the central conflict of the novel. And then the second quotation, I explore how uh, the behaviour in this chapter is used to foreshadow future events and look to the uh, or inform the larger plot. I think there's many angles that you could take when thinking about how to explain rather than analysing. And I list those in the next uh, slide. Here's an overview of the key points to hit when approaching the Part B response. The most tricky thing is the slightly different approach to explanations, where you can look at lots of different angles. And really, as long as you end up saying something interesting and relevant, uh, it's OK uh, to talk about many, many things. For example, you can think about how a chapter informs a larger aspect of the plot. You can draw links between key themes or think about how uh, certain key themes are contributed to. Um, you can just think about the broader connotations um, of the quotation. 
And alternatively, you can just look at how uh, the quotations are used to develop relationships further or, or even or even character for that matter really as long as it's something that adds detail and shows a bit of insight and it's relevant to the question all of that will um, award decent marks this slide shows an example of what your options will look like in the English language imaginative writing assessment. You're given a choice of two questions which will each provide a scenario or type of scenario to write about. In this, in this case question five says write about, about a childhood friendship and question six says write about a time when you or someone you know had an exciting experience. The purpose of imaginative writing is to write an accurately written and engaging story in the time provided. You should probably spend about five to ten minutes planning and the rest of the 55 minutes writing the actual story. It's worth noting, and it says this with both questions, that your response could be real or imagined. So it can be based on a real event that you've experienced or it could be completely fictional. It's entirely up to the writer whether they want to write in first or third person. Unlike many of your exams, the imaginative writing assessment will be entirely skill-based rather than knowledge-based. And therefore, the, most of your, the bulk of your time should be spent honing or revising those skills. One key aspect, or one very good way of getting an excellent grade, is to make sure that use of spelling, punctuation, grammar, paragraphing, etc. is all there and all accurate. Therefore, you need to find ways to practice using those skills. I recommend that this is done in three ways. First of all, I think reading is an essential way to revise use of spelling, punctuation and grammar. I think practicing writing is essential and I'll give you some example questions later on which you could use to practice. And then finally, I've uh, given a link to the BBC Bite Size GCC website, which provides a range of really useful tasks, tools, videos and tests that are used to revise your use of spelling, punctuation and grammar. It's worth remembering as well that you're going to have to use some more complex structures in order to get top marks. For example, using commas for parentheses or um, using a range of punctuation such as semicolons. One particular frustration of mine is students shifting between past and present tense throughout their stories. One way for students to avoid doing this is to read regularly in order to uh, get used to applying the correct tenses, particularly um, in verbs. Just to exemplify this, I've actually just copied a, an extract from the second Harry Potter book and just underlined a few examples of verbs being used in the past tense, such as arrived, kept, thundered, um, reported. I think it's very essential that when students are practicing their writing in preparation for this assessment, they get very, very used to always maintaining a consistent tense preferably past tense. If a student fails to maintain a consistent tense, they will not be getting into the top bracket of marks. I think one of the hardest things for students in an imaginative writing assessment is being able to come up with an engaging story in such a short period of time. I think there's a few tricks to follow that uh, could definitely help with this. I think one is making sure that uh, they follow a specific or an appropriate story structure. Um, this will normally have a clear beginning, middle and end. Now, if students find it difficult to fit all of that into a 55 minute assessment it might alternatively be uh, a better choice to just focus on a specific moment by which I mean just a specific event or a very specific occurrence in someone's life and just focusing on that for the entire time for example 
um, a bus journey that goes awry for some reason. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be tied up in quite as much detail as a complete story. Another option is using um, an interesting setting or perspective. I think uh, a lot of um, boys at Wilmington uh, Grammar um, consume a lot of interesting media, whether it's films, video games, stories, um, uh, uh, books, um, and they have a lot of specific context and things like that to draw on. Could they, for example, tell a story set in World War II or um, in a near future um, world? Um, or could they tell a story from an interesting perspective, like, for example, um, from the perspective of an um, inanimate object or, or, a, or a fictional uh, creature, um, however, however that may work? Um, I think the overall tip though would be as well just to make sure these stories are, are mature that they allow you to explore some complex topics I think that the worst stories are always ones that involve really quite silly things like um, getting into a, a, a fight um, or um, a secret agent going on a killing spree for some reason and then it all just becomes very gory and very very um, juvenile um, and and really just focus on something that has a bit of emotion has a bit of, of character development I know that's easier said than done really the only way that um, we can improve those skills is is by practicing and I'm going to share some um, potential topics on the next slide that could be used as um, opportunities to practice planning. My final bit of advice before practicing planning and revising um, is just to remember that a lot of these topics are very broad and the idea is that uh, the exam boards want you uh, to pursue something that you're interested in and that these shouldn't be particularly restrictive. If, for example, um, we look about um, look at um, write about life in the future. Well, that could be a very boring description of um, a literal world and describing flying cars and things like that. Or alternatively, you could look at um, a very complex and interesting almost dystopian world that has some interesting uh, politics, perhaps inspired by events that are happening. Um, at the moment, not I, I don't mean necessarily um, global pandemics, but things that are perhaps more political um, or ideological. Um, and from that, I think that um, uh, students can write some really interesting stories, particularly taking inspiration for from many um, dystopian novels that I'm sure a lot of you um, have read, like um, The Hunger Games and um, Maze Runner or even 1984.